Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. As many of you guys know, working with pure locality boas is one of my main passions in life. And really, I can think of no other group of animals that's as rewarding and fulfilling to work with. That being said, like all things in life, there are both pros and cons to keeping and breeding locality boas. And today I wanted to go through some of both the pros and cons, the advantages and disadvantages of working with locality boas. I recently came out with a video about the pros and cons of working with morph boas, where I went through the same type of analysis. And I hope that these videos can give some guidance to newcomers to the world of keeping and breeding boa constrictors, since there's currently scores, if not hundreds of different types of boas to select from to work with. So maybe this will help narrow it down a little bit. Um, so if you haven't checked out my morph boa video, I would recommend you look at that. And for more videos on all aspects of keeping and breeding boas in captivity, please subscribe to the Brian Boas YouTube channel. Before we get into the pros and cons of locality boas, I just wanted to give a brief definition of what a locality boa is. And there are probably a number of definitions out there that people are using. But to me, a locality boa is an animal that descends from founder animals that were collected in a very specific geographic locality. And all of the animals in that particular line can be traced back to that specific geographic locality. Ideally, you have some kind of documentation that it is truly from this particular locality, such as breeder paperwork or a CITES permit. I mean, ideally it would be to collect yourself, but we know that's unfortunately impossible for most people. Um, but if you don't have the documentation, in some cases, you can be pretty confident about locality based on the physical characteristics, such as with this Qualkiboa. In other cases, you have really no uh, accurate identification of locality based on the physical characteristics, as is the case with many of the true red tail boas. And the other important thing is that these animals are pure. They don't have any animals that did not descend from the specific locality mixed into their bloodline. So that takes us to the first advantage of working with pure locality boas. Trying to preserve boas as close to their natural state as possible in captivity provides a buffer against extinction in the wild. And should boas go extinct in the wild of whatever form, it's possible that they might be repopulated at some point in the future. And this has been done before for certain mammal and bird species with some successes. That being said, it's probably unlikely that it would happen with um, some reptile species. And what we're, the real problem here is not the loss of the species per se, but it's the loss of the habitat that sustains the species. So if an environment is destroyed, such as the Kral Key Islands, where these Kral Key boas live, does it really make sense putting boas back to an environment that doesn't exist anymore, at least not in its natural state? That being said, uh, boas offer a rich amount of biodiversity. And um, the fact is, is that hobbyists have actually bred a lot more different types of boas and snakes than most zoos. So there's this great reservoir of biodiversity of snakes that's now in the hands of responsible hobbyists. And even if some of these boas go extinct in the wild at some point in the future, which hopefully isn't going to happen, at least we have this great uh, reservoir of biodiversity in captivity. The other thing is that respect for this biodiversity and enjoyment of these animals hopefully will lead people to want to preserve the natural habitats in which they live. The second advantage to working with locality boas is you can learn a great deal about biology and evolution by studying them. So one example are the Kral Key boas, like this guy. And these animals are descended from the mainland Belize boas. Um, at some point, probably tens of thousands of years ago, some of these boas made it to this small island off the coast of Belize. And a few of them were able to survive despite the harsh environment and the small amount of food and other resources. And so the selective pressures of this lack of food led to the evolution of the smaller, more uh, slender boas that have kind of a more arboreal habit than um, the mainland boas living 
and trees and or coiling around mangrove roots. The sizes of these guys as adults is only about three and a half to five feet versus the mainland Belize boas are several feet longer. So they were able to evolve to uh, that new environment. And so studying the relationships between island boas and the mainland form can really offer a lot of valuable lessons about how life evolved on Earth. The third pro to working with locality boas is there's such a huge amount of diversity within this group of animals. So as most of you guys know, boa constrictors used to be classified as just one species, boa constrictor, and they've recently been reclassified into two or even three species, including boa imperator and boa sigma. And within this group, which uh, stretches all the way from northern Mexico down to Argentina, we have this huge amount of diversity. We have diversity in size, shape, color, behavior, and all other physical characteristics. The size can be anywhere from around three to about 14 feet. Um, this is a Tar Humar Mountain Dwarf Boa. This is one of the smallest, if not the smallest, forms of locality boa. This is a 10-year-old female who's full size at about four feet. There's diversity in terms of the body shape. We have the long elongated body of the Pearl Island Boa, Boa Constrictor Sabogue. And uh, on the other hand, we have a short, uh, more compact a body shape of the Bolivian boa, boa constrictor amorali. There's a lot of different colors. We have dark boas, we have light boas, we have really colorful boas. So there's really something for everyone. And so when you have such a, a group with such rich biodiversity, there's a huge amount of appreciation and enjoyment you can get out of them, as well as things that you can learn by studying these fascinating animals. In contrast with morph boas, you actually have a lack of diversity. And you might be thinking, well, you know, some of them have a di different colors and they have different patterns and things like that. But when you actually look at their behavior and their body size and body shape, they all pretty much act pretty similarly. And that's because they've been all mixed together. And whenever you breed a lot of animals from uh, different sources together, you get this mixture that's just pretty much homogeneous and there's not a lot of diversity. Which brings us to the fourth advantage of working with pure locality boas, and that is they are a good investment and hold their value a lot better than morph boas. So as I discussed in my video on pros and cons of morphs, one of the main disadvantages is that morph breeding is basically a pyramid scheme, and boas will often start out with price tags of tens of thousands of dollars, and then they drop to just a few hundred dollars, often in a decade or two, or sometimes even, even uh, faster than that. So that being said, locality boas prices have actually gone up quite a bit in the last 10 years. Many localities have more than doubled in price. Um, the first time I ever bred boa constrictors, it was Argentine boas, like this girl. This was back in 2005, before um, there was Facebook and YouTube and all of the internet classified sites for reptiles, I actually ended up selling my Argentine bill or babies for $100 a piece on Craigslist. Um, now the going rate for Argentine boas is around four to $500, and it's very hard to find them even at that price, just because there's such a high demand and such a low supply. In addition, I have a good buddy that just got out of locality boas recently and sold off his collection. And he was able to sell a lot of his animals for about twice the price that he had paid for them. Of course, he had to put in a lot of his time and energy and money to raise them up. But that being said, this is not something you could ever do with a morph boa collection where the prices of morphs are always falling. Uh, some are just falling faster than others. Last but not least, the fifth advantage to keeping locality boas is that they're such beautiful animals. So the color and texture and patterns of these animals can be just exquisite, like this true red tail boa. This is a Suriname BCC. I think the true red tail boas might well be the pinnacle of serpentine evolution. That being said, there's, I haven't found a locality boa that I did not like 
I think they all have their own beauty in their own way. And if I had unlimited amounts of time, space, and money, I would want just about every possible locality boa in my collection. As far as morph boas, I can't say the same thing. There's some morph boas that I think are cool to look at and to have in my collection, but there's quite a few morph boas that I don't have any desire to have in my collection for a number of different reasons. Um, and with locality boas, they're just all, I think they all have something to offer the keeper of reptiles. Now I want to discuss some of the disadvantages to keeping locality boas. And the first has to do with what exactly is a locality and how do you define a locality. I've seen it defined a number of different ways. It can be defined by a country, such as a Suriname red tail boa. It can be defined by a village, such as the Pokagon Suriname red tail boa. It can be defined by a region, such as the North Brazilian boa. It can be defined by a port of export, such as the Iquitos uh, Peruvian boa, like this one. And so, in each case, you're trying to get a more and more specific classification. And it's implied that somehow the more specific the category, the smaller the locality, the more pure or the, the better that that particular boa is. And I would have to disagree with this line of thinking. So I talked about some of these ideas in my video on uh, Suriname versus I'm a little concerned because this guy is a little uh, ornery. I don't want to get bitten. Um, my boas tend to bring out the worst behavior when they're on camera. But um, uh, I talked about Guiana versus Suriname and some of the issues with that uh, distinction. And so I would say that um, the problem with a lot of the ideas behind locality boas is it's implying that all boas from a specific locality are going to be the same and that boas from different localities are not going to be the same. And we know that that's really not the case. Boas from a specific locality in the wild, even in the exact same place, often look very different and have different characteristics. And then there are boas that are from different localities that look pretty similar. And there's really no actual taxonomic criteria to differentiate a certain locality boas, such as the case with the Guiana and the Suriname locality boas. And in fact, Suriname and Guiana are artificial creations. They're, they're countries and the population is actually can interbreed between the two. So we have issues about what exactly is a locality leading to some misunderstandings. And I saw once that a guy was selling a Peruvian boa. It was a beautiful animal and it was priced for less than half of the going rate. And he said right in his ad on fauna.com that the reason why is he bought it from a wholesaler. They told him it was a Peruvian boa. He asked them after he bought it whether it was a Quitos Peruvian or a Pacalpa Peruvian and they told him they couldn't tell. And so he considered it was less valuable and it was impure and thus it didn't belong in his collection. So um, unfortunately, the difference between the Iquitos and the Pocalpa Peruvian boas, in my opinion, is very subtle if there is even any difference at all. And Iquitos and Pocalpa are simply ports of export. So the boas are collected or farmed from the rainforest for many, many miles around and exported from these ports. So it might be artificial to claim that a Iquitos boa is really different from a Pocalpa Peruvian boa. The second disadvantage with working with locality boas is that the locality can often be misrepresented by uh, fraudulent or ignorant sellers. For example, hog island boas are often crossed with hypomelanistic uh, common boas, and the resulting offspring are known as hypohog boas. Um, but to the untrained observer, some of the offspring can look very similar to the real pure hog island boas. So there's a lot of these hypo hog island boas crosses out there and people get to buy them all the time. And I see people asking about them on Facebook groups and it's just kind of um, disheartening to see that these people have been deceived to think that they're the, the real thing. Another example are the uh, Honduran fire belly boas like this 
girl that I held back from 20, my uh, 2017 breeding, or I'm sorry, 20, this is a 2018 baby. And these animals supposedly descended from a group of animals brought back from an island called Roatan, which is in the Caribbean off the coast of Honduras. And um, there's some documentation claiming that they're an island boa, but then there's also um, people who say that they're not an island boa, that they're really mainland Honduran boas that have just these abnormally bright colors. And that the whole story was concocted in order to sell the boas. So I'm not 100% sure either way. If any of you guys have any intel on this, I would really love it if you would comment below. Um, but you know, it's you can't always know where your boas came from. Um, the other thing is just because you have paperwork, CITES papers, or breeder receipts, doesn't mean that they're authentic. It can, it can people can easily swap. Uh, the CITES papers from a different snake for your snake and they can claim it's what sa it said on those papers. So you have to be 100% sure that you trust the particular breeder that you're working with. The next disadvantage with locality boas is that even if you have a pure locality boa that after several generations it might be changed so much by captivity that it's no longer really representative of the wild population. So this is a Coupes Pastel Colombian boa, and this is a pure Colombian bloodline with no other contributing um, localities. But it's been selected for these beautiful pastel orangey colors. So at this point, even though it's still a pure Colombian boa, is it really representative of the wild uh, Colombian boa population? I would say probably not. And the reason why the boa populations change in captivity over time is due to a number of factors. The first is something called the bottleneck effect. The founder animals that the captive populations are descended from were a very small um, number of boas that's really not representative of the entire population. And then we have uh, selection going on, both conscious and unconscious selection on the part of the breeder. So we want our boas to have the most beautiful colors, and we also want this nice docile temperament. So we select them the way we want them to be. We select brightly colored animals and docile animals, which are gonna breed and contribute their genes to the next generation. And thus the next generation is changed. And these are selection pressures that would not be present in the wild population. In addition, there's unconscious selection. Whereas being in captivity favors certain genes and certain behaviors in the boas. You know, they're, we're going to select for boas which are better adapted to captivity. Ones that can live in smaller tubs or they can eat on frozen rodents and things like that. More docile behavior, less, uh, less high stress animals. So the animals are fundamentally changing. And with multiple generations, you get to the point where you probably can't really say that they're true locality boas. Really, they're a domestic form of the true locality boas. And the only way to get around this would be to introduce wild-caught, unrelated stock from that locality every few generations, which unfortunately is not possible um, since many of the countries have closed their export of any of these animals. So at some point in the future, we may have to consider locality boas to be, in effect, a type of morph. They're really locality type boas. They're a captive representation of a locality boa rather than a true locality boa. The fourth disadvantage to working with locality boas is some locality boas are extremely rare in captivity, and it can be very difficult to find enough animals to put together a breeding group. For example, the Corn Island boas, like this, adult male are only bred by a few hobbyists and they're all descended from a small group of animals that was imported a few decades ago. So if you want to work with corn island boas you may need to get onto a waiting list and you might need to wait years before some captive babies become available. So it can take a lot of patience to put together a breeding group. In addition because of the small sizes of the founder populations, you may have to worry about the effects of inbreeding. 
And I did a video on inbreeding a few weeks ago, so please check that out if you're interested. But with locality boas, you really need to carefully balance the effects of inbreeding with maintaining a pure locality in captivity. A final disadvantage to working with locality boas over morph boas is they can be harder to maintain in captivity. In general, locality boas have more exacting environmental requirements in terms of the temperature, the humidity, and other environmental factors. And then they also are often harder to breed as well. Typically, you may need to allow locality boas an additional year or two to reach adult size, especially with the true red tail boas. And then you may need to initiate a complicated cycling regimen, um, for example, with the true red tail boas. Uh, from what I've heard, often morph boas will breed without any temperature cycling. The other issue is that often you might have two compatible or two apparently compatible locality boas that you pair up and they're really well cycled, but for whatever reason they just don't seem to have an interest in each other. And this happens a lot with the true red tails. And then one final uh, issue with breeding the locality boas is it can be much harder to get some of the babies to feed. For example, the island boas like this hog island boa. Um, unfortunately, I found that only about one third of my hog island babies will feed from the start on live fuzzy mice. So often I'll have to assist feed them a mouse tail a few times before they'll feed on their own. So. It's you know, considerably more work than if they would just feed from the beginning, and it can be kind of frustrating sometimes. So that's a little bit about the pros and cons of, of locality boas. And as I mentioned at the beginning of these, this video, I still consider them to be the most rewarding group of animals to work with. So I highly encourage you to pursue the locality boas as long as you're aware of the challenges and you're, you can accept um, the difficulties associated with this. So I thanks for you for your attention watching this till the end of this video, which was a little bit longer than my typical videos. If you have any questions or comments, you can please write them below. And as always, feel free to reach out to me if I can be of any assistance. And remember to always enjoy your boas.